she has problems with me. She made some men angry. Tonight, 2020 follows the clues of an explosive whodunit. She was killed in her home by somebody she knew. A revolving door of men who could be suspects. An ex-husband, her angry ex-boyfriend. Because I'm f***ing my daughter. Or her brand new fiancé, engaged after just three weeks. i tell you what, man, this conversation's over. But then, the biggest bombshell of all. Why were you so convinced? Because Lucy taught us. Lucy speaking from the grave in her very own journal. I mean, she wrote it down. For the first time tonight, the jury, the verdict, the outrage with the police on trial too. Who dropped the ball? Who killed Lucy Johnson in the burning bed? Here now, Elizabeth Vargas and David Muir. Good evening. Elizabeth has the evening off. And as we come on the air, a question. Is a killer still walking the streets of a small American town? Because tonight, authorities say where there's smoke, there's fire. And not just a house on fire, but a burning bed. Tonight here, who was in that bed and was the killer one of them? You're about to get an inside look at the evidence. You decide. Here's Jim Avila. Three o'clock in the morning down Hidden Meadow Court. A warm, sticky night, clear skies, full moon. A peaceful scene shattered by a spark. Gaston County, 911. We have a, a house call, 48, 48, 4835, Hidden Meadow Court. Do you think we there's somebody inside? Twisted. Suddenly, the sky lights up bright. A house is burning, and it looks bad. Neighbors are horrified. We okay. think there is someone inside. Please help us. There's a lady's car here. She's not answering. There's no way she's going to survive this. And now at noon, a house burned down to the ground where a mother and two children lived. Eyewitness News reporter Ken Lemon, he's been on the scene with investigators all morning. Reporter Ken Lemon with ABC affiliate WSOC is among the first on the scene. Well, as you mentioned, police can't say if it is that woman. The house was in ruins, and you, you could tell that it was a pretty bad fire. The missing lady is 31-year-old Lucy Johnson, married twice, a well-liked young mother living with her two children, working as an emergency room nurse. Lucy's children are safe. They had spent the night with their respective fathers. But where is Lucy? And then I hear from more neighbors who say, you know, I was at the back door, I was at the door trying to get in, and I couldn't get inside. And they began to tell me about the woman they couldn't account for. This grim document obtained from the investigation file has the terrible answer. It shows a badly burned body in an upstairs bedroom. I do know I have a body in the house and you know, it is deceased. That body unrecognizable, identified only by dental x-rays and the serial numbers on her breast implants. And sadly, yes it is Lucy. A police officer calls her father, Mike Dodd. She informed me that there was a fire at Lucy's house. And uh, I asked her, I said, did Lucy get out? She said, no, Lucy's still in the house. Because I wrote down. With a body inside, this is more than a fire. Police are called, arson inspectors. It's an all-out investigation. In the ashes, those investigators immediately notice something strange, the burn patterns. A trained fire dog detects a suspicious trail of burnt gasoline leading from Lucy's bed down the blackened stairway and out the back door. Get one axe, Dan. No, this is arson. And then suddenly this car comes racing right up to the police tape, and this guy jumps out, and he runs into the arms of the first person there, and he starts crying. It's Mike Mead, and he's crying because inside the smoking hulk of a building is the woman with whom he's planning a future. When you get there, what do you see? Oh, Lord. Um, the house was um, still smoldering, still smoking. Lucy was his fiance. You think to this day that she was the love of your life? Yeah, I think she was. Mike Mead and Lucy Johnson were building that future in Gaston County, North Carolina, once known for cotton mills and corn whiskey, west of Charlotte, maybe south of Justice, where authorities now have to ask, who would want to burn Lucy's house down? Friends and family say Lucy was on the feisty side of Southern Belle, 
a good woman with a weakness for cigarettes, Mountain Dew, pickup trucks, and the men who drove them. Lucy's uncle, Ken Dye, likes to call some of them unsuitable gentlemen. She had problems with men. Bad choices. Bad choices. Dina Bradshaw has known Lucy since they were teenagers. She needed love. She never wanted to be by herself. And I believe that was her downfall. Lucy likes kids. She has a seven-year-old daughter with her first husband and a six-month-old infant son with a recent ex-boyfriend, a man named Jim Spielock, who makes his living at the nearby Catawba nuclear power plant. Now, lately, there is little love loss between Lucy and Jim, broken up before their baby is even born. In fact, after the delivery, right there in the recovery room, there is a nasty scene over, of all things, the newborn baby's name. I have never seen uh, an individual so obsessed with uh, the naming of a child. Private investigator Steve Eller says Spielock wants the baby named after him, James Spielock III. But headstrong Lucy would have none of that and names the boy Kaysen. That doesn't go over well with Daddy. They argue, and Lucy kicks Jim out of the maternity ward. And he doesn't go quietly, taking with him baby presents and the car seat. And he just went into a bizarre outrage. Takes her car and leaves her stranded at the hospital with no way home, no car seat. Jim and Lucy spend a lot of time in and out of court, fighting over custody, child support, and that name. Yes, yeah, she, 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 she wanted to get her way. She was going to get her way. That was Lucy. She was outspoken. Yes. She didn't take no stuff. But by the summer, some daylight begins to shine on Lucy's life. That's when she meets online 39-year-old Mike Mead. He has a pickup, but he also has a BMW, a successful inventor, an entrepreneur from nearby Fort Mill, South Carolina, who enjoys the finer things, like sit-down dinners at the steakhouse chain. She was dressed really nice. Um, I dressed up nice, and we went out to Longhorn, had dinner. You know, I was real curious about why she was wanting to date somebody when she just had a baby. And Can I ask you what was special about this relationship? How you get that attached that soon? I just felt like we really had this connection and we went right into family mode. The kids all got along, our three dogs got along. I mean, it was like just everything just clicked. They hit it off, whirlwind relationship, and right off the bat, less than three weeks after meeting, Lucy has some news for Mike. She is pregnant. Very unexpected, very unplanned. We just met this woman, right. and soon after you find out she's going to have your baby. That's right. Mike says he quickly got used to the idea of becoming a new dad. They were in love. Mike saved this voicemail Lucy left two nights before her sudden death. Hey, baby, it's me. Um, just call to say good night. I'm going to bed right now. Um, so I love you, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye. I was happy. I was tickled to death. You know, Lucy was beautiful, smart. She was a fantastic mother. You know, I, I couldn't think of anybody I'd want to have a baby with more. So tickled that just three months into their love affair, he gives Lucy a diamond engagement ring, a great big one. We felt like, you know, we're going to be together. We're going to have this baby. It's going to be wonderful. So, you know, let's just go ahead and get it. Let's, let's do it. A couple. home in Gastonia. Good times, says Mike, until a shadow is cast over the evening by the roar of a pickup truck outside. It's Jim Spielock, the ex-boyfriend, arriving for his visitation day, there to pick up his infant child for the night. When she came back from the door, her demeanor was all different. And what did he want from her that night? Well, I, he, he told her that he had filed a motion to take case into Pennsylvania for two weeks. Evening sport. So Mike goes home, Lucy drops by her close friend Dina's house to do her hair and show off that ring. It was a very nice ring, large diamond princess cut. It was a ring that he had pre uh, previously gave a girl before. He reused the ring and gave it to Lucy. Hours later, the spitfire of a young nurse, in love, engaged to a man of means, carrying his child, excited that her life is finally turning around. But now, it's all over. Lucy is dead. Her body sprawled across her burning bed. They said her body was positioned in a funny way on the bed. You, you believe that that looked like there was a struggle? Yes. 
the way it was described. Surprisingly, for the victim of a fire, there is no soot, no ash in her airways. That can mean only one thing. When the fire started, Lucy wasn't breathing. She was already dead. Suddenly, the police clam up. They have more disturbing clues to follow. They still wouldn't tell us anything. They, they wouldn't even tell us how she died. When we come back, if the fire didn't kill Lucy, what did? And the more unsettling question, who did? Some killed my daughter. continues with the burning bed. Once again, Jim Avila. As Lucy Johnson's house on Hidden Meadow Court smolders, Gaston County, North Carolina police are feeling the pressure. A nurse and caring mother of two with another baby on the way. Her badly scorched body found atop her burning bed. The police interrogation room needs a revolving door with a long list of exes from two husbands, a former boyfriend, and the fiance to question. Which way to turn? Everyone is watching, including local TV reporter Ken Lemon. And the thing that I think really drew people in is that you have a single mother, and she was excited about her you know, relationship and her engagement with this man. Where would the evidence lead police? First, a quick search of the house shown in this police video seems to rule out a stranger. No evidence of a break-in here. The locks are still intact. She was killed in her home. That's a total violation. And the belief is that she was killed in her home by somebody she knew, not by a stranger. Next, police move to the autopsy sketch. The medical examiner must have worn out his pen, illustrating the terrible damage. And there, inside Lucy's head, a find that will change the investigation. A bullet, and then more. Fragments of a second bullet. Conclusion, Lucy was shot twice in the back of the head. Now, it's not only an arson case. Now, friends, we have a murder. The very public search for a killer is on, and local media is watching. Still many questions today about a fire that took the life of a pregnant mother. We have several people of interest that we're looking at right now. So everybody's watching. People wanted to know who did this. Another clue from the crime scene, the burned out house. Lucy's engagement ring can't be found anywhere. But also missing, and perhaps even more important, is a murder weapon. Where is the gun? Dive crews are back at Lake Wiley looking for evidence to solve a pregnant mother's murder. They target an area near a boat landing, not far from the home of a potential suspect, Lucy's ex-boyfriend, Jim Spielock. Two days of diving for a weapon didn't produce anything. There's no weapon. There's, There's no, no gun weapon. found. There's nothing. With no fingerprints, everything destroyed in the burned out house, no murder weapon, and no eyewitnesses to the crime, police must now turn to the circumstantial clues, starting with the men in Lucy's life. Lucy's uncle, Ken Dye, saw them come and saw them go. She made some men angry. She is. Gaston County Police open up the interrogation room. They bring in Philip Okralisa for questioning. He's Lucy's first husband and the father of her daughter, Lauren. When they were together, Okralisa was arrested for domestic violence twice. He comes in to tell police he never really hit Lucy, but he did grab her. But that trail cools when Okralisa has a tight alibi. The night of the fire, he says he was home all night and his new wife confirms it. On to Lucy's husband number two, Jim Johnson. Another relationship that got ugly at the end. He has a police record of violence against Lucy. And Lucy's friend Dina says she witnessed one incident. He had her cornered, drilling her like a sergeant, barking at her, verbally, loud. She was afraid. She was very afraid. He was a suspect because he had threatened to burn her house down. That's a pretty good reason to be a suspect, right, right? Right, But more investigation shows Johnson was on the Carolina coast, four hours away at the time of the crime, forcing police to dismiss him as a suspect. So now we turn our attention to Mike Mee, Lucy's new fiance and father-to-be. Mike and Lucy's romance was so recent that day at the fire was the first time her uncle Ken Dye had ever seen him. I didn't know who he was. Never met him before, didn't recognize him. 
And then I noticed that the detectives put him in the car and was talking to him. But of all the stops on Lucy Johnson's troubled trail of romance, one man stood out, at least to family and friends. Oh yes, at the very, very beginning, I thought Jim Spelock had did it, everyone did. James Spelock, the father of Lucy's infant son, is in the family's crosshairs. Lucy's father, Mike Dye. The son killed my daughter. Ken Dye says his mother, who raised Lucy from when she was a teenager, was convinced the minute she heard about the fire. She said, I know who done it. I said, who done it? She said, Jim Spelock done it. I knew immediately he did it. It's something I felt in the pit of my stomach. Why? Desperation. Lucy's marrying a successful guy that's going to be able to support her financially. Lucy's moving. It is documented Spelock has been fighting with Lucy over child support and custody. Lucy has pictures of bruises on her arms and in family court claims Spelock put them there while she was pregnant with their son. The relationship so poisonous, Jim Spelock had been recording their conversations. You're a very sneaky, manipulative person, but and it ain't gonna work. A manipulative person, Jim. I'm not. You're the one that did all of that. You're the one that was at the lawyer's office the day after I gave birth. I wasn't at the office. I was on the phone You're with You're concerned with yourself. That's Jim Spelock documenting his attempts to see his son. Do you plan on paying child support voluntarily? Well, I guess that's up to you. Can I see my son or not? I've seen him like five times since he's been born. Are yes, you going to let me bring, see him? Yes, and you can bring me some money when you come see him. Police want to know where Spelock was the night of the murder, but he has a plausible alibi, too. He tells police he was at his house all night with the baby. Did you stay here all night taking care of Casey? Yeah, I was here all night. <laughs> he has a roommate who says he didn't hear Jim leave. And police find and interview this woman, who was up late texting with Jim Spelock most of that night. Did you text on Tuesday? Um, he sent me the text at 4.30. Just to make sure you have it all night. But while the clues may be sending the family in Jim Spelock's direction, law enforcement is not convinced. And when other people began to focus their coverage towards Spelock, they were able to tell me early on, don't go there, don't do that. Police even issue a rare public statement clearing Spelock on paper. It's unheard of. Police are going in a different direction and they make an arrest. So who do you think the man in the orange jumpsuit is? We're live tweeting throughout tonight's show. Tweet me. Use the hashtag ABC2020. And when we come back here, we'll take you inside that police interrogation room, two cops and one suspect with a very strange way to show his grief. You'll see it for yourself. Twenty continues. Here again, Jim Avila. Breaking news out of Gaston County. It is breaking news. Surprising new clues in the murder of a mother of two. A shocking development in Gaston County, North Carolina's biggest murder mystery in years. New developments in the Lucy Johnson murder case. The man Lucy Johnson was in a bitter custody battle with is ruled out as her killer. And now, in an even more surprising move, the man Lucy had told everyone was the answer to her prayers, Mike Mead, is arrested. Police say Mike Mead shot Lucy Johnson to death in her home last summer. It catches everyone off guard, especially Mike Mead, the successful local businessman never before accused of a violent crime. The man no one suspected of threatening Lucy is now charged with arson, rape, and murder. Local TV reporter reporter Ken Lemon was on the case from the beginning. When the charges came out, they seemed to come out of left field. Prosecutors motivated by the sympathetic innocent victim and the death of her unborn child seek the death penalty. How did Mike Mead become the prime suspect? Police became suspicious when they first brought him in. He denied killing Lucy. But after this interrogation obtained by Discovery Channel, Investigators are convinced that the whirlwind storybook romance is a sham. I just felt so in love with her, so close to her. It just, you know, it just hurts me thinking that you guys would think that I would even. Well, I don't have no motive. Why the f I was going, we were supposed to be on vacation this week, man. I was really looking forward to spending my life with this chick. He usually described her as 
chick or that chick or something to that effect, um, which was very, very unusual. Eddie Meeks is one of the prosecutors convinced Meade is the killer. We know he didn't trust her. And it was in direct contradiction to his love of my life story. And police say Meade was suspicious and jealous, pointing to this exchange. When you were suspicious of Lucy a little bit. Yeah, well, I just want to make sure she was shooting you. Know, there wasn't somebody else there banging her or something. Well, if she was banging somebody, what would you do? I'd walk out. It was a tense few hours for Meade. You are the one who was not telling us anything. I tell you what, man, this conversation's over. Okay, I'm done with this. He seemed to enjoy the uh, the cat and mouse game, so to speak. In fact, for police, Mike Mead was his own worst enemy. They interview Lucy's best friend, Dina Bradshaw, who tells them about an odd conversation she had with Mead the day after the murder. He was in too good of a mood. He was laughing. He was happy. He's talking about Lucy's breast and how he was going to miss them. He was not sad that he just lost his fiance. Meade's behavior is enough to raise suspicion with Lucy's family. At Lucy's memorial service, her uncle says Meade made more inappropriate comments, this time about a 17-year-old relative. Mike leaned over and said, man, I sure like to have me some of that. This was at Lucy's, at, at, at her memorial service. The love of his life, as he called her. He was acting like he was at a party. As prosecutors ready for trial, they work to build a case that Mike Mead has a history of rough encounters with women he has dated. More than a dozen women who say Mike was vindictive, aggressive, pushy, and outright creepy. You start to hear things like he has a pattern, a pattern of meeting women online, a pattern of a relationship that seems strong, and then all of a sudden it turns really bad. A key witness for the prosecution, best friend Dina Bradshaw, says Mike and Lucy fought constantly about her pregnancy. Mike, she says, wanted her to get an abortion. He never believed that the baby was his. Her feelings were hurt, that he did not want her to have the baby. Odd behavior, a possible pattern of aggressive encounters with women, and some circumstantial evidence. Would it be enough? It's off to trial in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is about cold-blooded, premeditated murder. The prosecution tells the jury Mike is on a mission to be done with Lucy and the baby, and he wants his ring back. This is a twelve dollars to $15,000 ring that Mr. Mead admittedly gave her. Uh, she's not the first person to have that ring, but she definitely was the last. If it was going to end, he was going to take the diamond with him. Ms. Johnson, I believe, and we believe, lost her life over that diamond. This is about a control device. Police never find that diamond, but they were excited about another find at the house, the gold standard of evidence, DNA. The fire at Lucy's house did not burn everything. Evidence technicians are able to recover DNA inside Lucy. Diane Turbyfield covered the trial for the Gaston Gazette. There was some biological evidence of that Michael Meade had had sex with Lucy Johnson within about 24 hours of her death. Why does that matter? Prosecutors say Meade denied having sex with her that night, but police say he did, and DNA proves it. What's more, they say it was rape. Lucy would not have had sex with him willingly. Lucy was pregnant, and she had a condition that made having sex dangerous for the health of the baby. It was a flashpoint in Mike Meade's police interrogation. He is vehement the sex was consensual and several days before the murder. But you said you had sex with her after that. Really? No, because, because she begged. You still had sex? I, come on, don't stop giving us a bunch of crap. But not get it to kind of say, I'm yeah, mad. Be super gentle. Don't give us a bunch of crap that you didn't do this when you clearly did. At trial, prosecutors aren't finished. They have a blockbuster surprise, a star witness who tells jurors, hold on, Mike Mead, he says, confessed to him. That's right, outright admitted he pulled the trigger that killed Lucy Johnson. Lucy's uncle can barely believe his ears. He said that Mike Mead told him he didn't mean to shoot her the first time, that he just shot at her to scare her, and it hit her. And it freaked him out so bad because she was jerking around and 
that he went and shot her again in the back of the head. The prosecution ran with that. She reached up to her head and said, oh my God, you shot me, Mike. Please don't let me die. Powerful, huh? But there's a problem. That star witness, he has a bit of a credibility issue. You see, he is a convicted child rapist who says Meade told him all of this while both were locked up together for a short time in county jail. I've never confessed to a cop. I've never confessed to my lawyers. I've never confessed to anybody because I'm not going to confess for something I didn't do. But, but I'm going to confide in a, in a, in a, in a guy that raped this girl. As the prosecution closes its case, is the deck stacked against Mike Mead, or is it a house of cards? Next, the murder victim testifies from the grave. Lucy's journal names a suspect. I mean, she wrote it down. It's a former boyfriend, but which one? continues with the burning bed once again Jim Avila in the modern tower that is Charlotte's Mecklenburg County Courthouse the state of North Carolina is working overtime to put Mike Mead to death for the murder of his pregnant fiance Lucy Johnson did you kill Lucy absolutely not absolutely not not one thing to do with Lucy's death did Mike Mead murder Lucy Johnson? No, he didn't. And how do you know that? All the evidence says that he didn't. Really? What about all those women? Prosecutors say Mike mistreated. Many of them at the end of the relationship were quite unhappy with you. Right. They're angry at you. Yeah, sure. I, I went down to that. They said at my bond hearing that there was 18 women that came forward and signed sworn affidavits of abuse that I'm a violent person and stuff. And, and I challenge you to show one. Not one. There's never been one complaint from any woman that I've ever been with that I laid a hand on them physically. And are there girls out there that ended badly with them? Who hasn't? But you never hit any of them? Never. Never threatened them? Never. Never, never stalked down. any of them, never burned any of their house, and never raped anybody, nothing. The expectation uh, coming from the DA's office is that we're going to hear a lot of these women. But the jury never hears that. We don't see not one of these women take the stand. That's right. The judge ruled that their stories were inadmissible, irrelevant, because none of those women had ever accused him of a crime. Okay, but what about the engagement ring, the so-called blood diamond? Prosecutors say it's part of the motive. Meade was done with Lucy, didn't want that baby, and wanted his ring back. It's a $15,000 ring. Uh, just never was found. We thought we found that to be very, very strange, very odd. But it's not airtight because it wasn't like it was found in Mike Meade's pocket or in his drawer or in his car. Right. It just wasn't found. It just wasn't found. Mike Mead lives alone, so on the night of the murder, there's no one but his dog to vouch for it. And when I went to bed that night, God knows I didn't think I needed an alibi. You know, if the dog could talk, we'd be in good shape, but you know, dogs can't talk. But Mead offers police three electronic alibis. First, he says his alarm system, as he demonstrated to us, shows he was at home all night. Two, his cell phone also puts him at home all night. Three, he was playing Madden NFL on PlayStation, and the timestamp on the game places him at home at the crucial time. But how does Meade answer the prosecution claim that the DNA evidence proves he forced sex with Lucy on the night of the murder and lied about it? Meade's defense investigator, Steve Ellers, admits if the DNA found in Lucy was fresh, Mike was there that night and murdered her. The perpetrator goes in, rapes her, shoots her, burns her house down. But on cross-examination, the prosecution witness is forced to concede that critical DNA may not be all that fresh. And just as Mike claimed, could have been from sex days before the murder. That semen was not the home run or the smoking gun they thought they were going to have. And if that isn't enough of a Perry Mason moment, listen up. The defense is granted a rare gift. The judge allows them to stand up in open court in front of the jury and not only proclaim Mike Mead's innocence, they get to point their finger at the man they say is the real killer. In North Carolina, the rule is pretty strict. You can't do that unless you've got direct evidence pointing to the guilt of someone else, relevant evidence. 
Unleashed, the defense turns prosecution and puts Jim Spelock on trial, starting with his alibi, that he was at his house with his baby, his roommate didn't hear him leave, and there was a woman who first told police Spelock and she were texting all night, but then revised her story. Did I think it was weird that he sent me a text at three? Yes. Okay. It was out of character for him. She showed back up at the police department and said, he didn't text me all night. Actually, he stopped texting me for two and a half hours. Ironically, at the two and a half hours when Lucy was being killed and her house was being set on fire. In fact, by the time of the trial, Lucy's been dead for three years. But now the jury is about to hear from her again. That's right. Lucy becomes the star witness at her own murder trial, offering stunning testimony from the grave written in this pink polka dot notebook, a journal Lucy kept to build a custody case against Jim Spelock. Lucy told us over and over again in her own words who she thought she was in danger from. And it wasn't just all about that pink notebook. The prosecution witness, Dina Bradshaw, reluctantly delivered some devastating evidence in Mike Mead's favor. And she said, well, if anything happens to me, you know who did it. And so she was referring to Jim Spelock. But it was all in laughter. Laughed it off, maybe. But then she brought it up again. But she had said, well, remember what I said, you know, referring to if she's killed, that Jim Spelock did it. And we were laughing, and she left. That was the night she was murdered. And in that pink notebook, Lucy also documents accounts of Spelock's online gambling and an interest in cross-dressing that extended to buying sexual paraphernalia on the internet while he was supposed to be working at the nuclear power plant. It's just about two weeks before her death, for the first time ever, she was able to document, to actually document on the computer that he was purchasing these items. Documentation Lucy had just turned over to her custody lawyer days before her death. Mr. Spelunk was aware that she had the proof of her allegations. That's the defense case. Jim Spelock murdered Lucy Johnson because she was about to win the custody case and reveal his darkest secrets. How more definitive can you be? That's another reason why at first we felt like it was him. But I've learned, don't jump to conclusions. He was perfect person to be frank for a crime. Jim Spelock turned down our request for an interview, but denies he murdered Lucy or bought women's clothes for himself. And prosecutor Eddie Meeks believed him. Regardless of all these different arrows pointing, all these red herrings, at the end of the day, when you weigh all the evidence, it was only one arrow, and that pointed at Michael Meade. But who does the jury believe? So the question tonight, what would you make of those writings in Lucy's journal, enough to influence how you'd vote on the jury? Let us know on Twitter. Use the hashtag ABC2020. And you'll hear from that jury when we come back for the first time, revealing why they decided what they did right here on 2020. We'll be right back. When 2020 continues, what the jury heard, what they thought, and their bombshell verdict based on Lucy's journal. I mean, she wrote it down. But which name did she write? Next. <music> 2020 continues. Here again, Jim Avila. Lucy Johnson's 34th birthday, if she had lived. And for her fiance, Mike Mead, Judgment Day. The jury announces they have reached a verdict after nearly nine hours deliberation. Well, I'm always terrified while I'm waiting for a jury. You can never be sure. People ask criminal defense attorneys all the time, how can you defend somebody that you know is guilty? Trust me, it is much harder to defend someone when you truly believe they're innocent. And here it is, the verdict. Michael Lane Me, not guilty. All right, members of the jury, thank you very much for your work on this case. Not guilty on all counts. Mike Me goes from dead man walking to find me the nearest exit. Just thank God that I'm free. I fully expected not guilty. Why were you 
not surprised when they said not guilty? Because I had sat in the same trial for seven weeks that they had. And? And if I was sitting on that jury, I would have been going, you know, what in the world is going on with this case? So 2020 gathered 11 jurors and returned them to their seats in the same courtroom for their first group interview, where it was clear that the defense strategy worked. I don't understand how they were able to come to trial and not even give a second look at Jim Spelock. A key element for the jury, Lucy's own words in her journal. So Lucy Johnson herself told you, a juror, Jim Spelock did it. If anything were to happen to me, Speedlock did it. I mean, she wrote it down. He wanted that son named after him, and she wouldn't do it. And they thought Speedlock had motive. The women's clothing Lucy said he bought for himself. James Speedlock was backed into a corner at this point. I, I think, think he was des desperate in that he needed to stop that from being out in public. The jurors tell us in all Lucy's messages from the grave, they found not one word against Mike Need. There was never any entry in any of her journals about him doing anything aggressive to her at all. I thought the state was really grasping at straws. The evidence was overwhelming as far as Mike Need not doing it. And that's hard to hear, isn't it? That's hard to hear. <laughs> The jurors saved their harshest criticism for the police, comparing them to a classic fictional North Carolina law enforcement buffoon. I called them Barney Fife. In my mind, I said, we, we got a, bun of, a bunch of Barney Fife. I think Barney they, they, got, they don't have yeah, a clue what they do. Mm -hmm. They blew it. And I think that's what bothers me about this case the most. And we do have a horrendous murder case that has not been solved. It leaves you wondering. So whether it was bad police work or prosecuting the wrong man or perhaps the perfect crime that allowed Mike Mead to get away with murder, one thing for sure, no one thinks Lucy Johnson got justice. Since Mike Mead has been tried and acquitted, mm -hmm. and since you don't believe that there's anybody else out there that could have done the crime, Lucy will never get justice in your mind. Not in my mind. Today, Jim Spelock has full custody of his son, Kaysen, who after Lucy's death, he renamed James Spelock III. Mike Mead says, although he is free, he lives under a cloud of suspicion. All right, well, we interviewed Meeks, okay? To this day, he thinks you did it. Well, to this day, he's an idiot. Where there's smoke, there's fire. The evidence is clear. I have no respect for Meeks. So, you know, what Meeks thinks, I don't really care what I think matters is what the 15 jurors that heard the evidence think. Meade has moved from South to North Carolina trying to live a new life. Did it bother you that even though you were acquitted, there are people there to this day who believe that you got away with murder? Well, sure, it would bother anybody. Oh, it's excruciating, it's excruciating. Right now, Meade is in the middle of an open lawsuit charging his civil rights were violated, and he was falsely prosecuted by the Gaston County Police. The police say they cannot comment on a pending legal matter. You ever, ever close your eyes now and, and think about what it would be like if none of this happened? Where would your life be with Lucy right now? Do you do that? Mm. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I would have a wife, a beautiful wife and a little boy, and yeah.